नमस्कार वेलकम बैक टू दिस सेकेंड सीरीज ऑफ लेक्चर ऑन ह्यूमन एरर्स लास्ट क्लास आई एक्सप्लेन्ड टू यू वॉट इज ह्यूमन एरर आई क्रिएटेड अ फिक्टेटियस प्रोफाइल एंड अ विनाट एंड आई शोड टू यू हाउ एरर्स कैन हैपन आई ऑल्सो डिस्कस्ड the different types of errors that can occur starting from output errors which are commission and omission errors to the classification of errors in terms of cognitive framework we use the idea of slips and mistakes and explained how errors have a cognitive basis i further introduced this srk paradigm of classification of errors towards the end i discussed human reliability and the steps of performing a human reliability analysis i discussed how we start by first looking at where errors can occur then predict certain kind of errors add the probabilities of these errors and finally come out with a probability coefficient of certain type of errors which can occur during a task performance we also discussed how to use the therp human error rate prediction model to study errors the aim of today's lecture will be to continue the study of errors use some more classification systems of errors and then give you solutions as to what can be done to reduce human errors now human errors can occur because of an unconscious effort from the human or it could happen because of a conscious effort and in the story that i related in the beginning of the lecture i showed to you how these two kind of errors can be classified so a brief sum up of the therp which is the technique for human rate prediction i will outline the steps of the therp model so the model starts by first looking at output behaviors what kind of human output happen when a certain input is supplied by the system and how these outputs can lead to errors once i am able to classify and pinpoint my error i start by selecting a point in the sequence of behavior where is the error taking the example of a car breakdown during a snowstorm there could be multiple reasons for it it could be an environmental reason it could be a reason on the part of the user his monitoring lapses insufficient sleep or other 
person related factor or it could be due to the failure of the brake system. Assuming that we are looking at the brake system, we can look at what possible reasons could be there. So, given that it is established that the brake is the reason for the failure, starting from that point, we can start investigating why did the brake fail. It could be because it was never tested or it could be because it was tested, but insufficient fiction or other reason led to a sudden failure and other reasons for its failure. So, we start from a point where the failure has happened and create an event tree. So, the event tree is basically a detailed sequence of action forward from the point of the error sequence. It determines what happens if error occurs for each action in the task analysis. So, we do a task analysis of all those reasons why the brake could have failed and from there we determine the error rate. We could also use a fault tree whereas in the action tree or the event tree we moved forward from the point of error towards all possible paths that can be taken. In the fault tree, we move backward from all possible actions to the error. So, it is directionally opposite. Then we use the method of dropping those actions which could not have led to the error. In our example of the car accident during a snowstorm, if we very well know that the individual driving the car did not suffer from any performance deficit and the storm or environmental conditions was not too difficult to drive, we will drop these as the reasons for error. So, we carefully and conservatively look at those actions which stand a lower chance of being considered for the reason for error. After we have done this, we determine the probability of error for each action, whether it is omission, commission or extraneous factor. We can use experimental data to find out why the brake failure happened and the car met with an accident. We combine the various probabilities from various actions and create multiple equations to account for corrections. Now, we have discussed all these points in the last lecture and I was just summing up the method of THERP. We can use the GEMS, the generic error modeling system with the HRA. Now, GEMS is helpful not only with classification of errors, but it can also be used with human reliability analysis. GEMS determine the cognitive aspects of human error by incorporating the SRK model to explain normal slip and miss mistakes. GEMS help explain when an appropriate operator is likely to move into the rule and knowledge based system. So, by including the predictions from the generic error monitoring system, we can come to know the cognitive reasons behind the error. When the individual has moved from the automatic skill based behavior to the knowledge based or the rule based behavior, this can be evident from the use of gem and also by looking at these transitions we can come to know why the error has happened. 
was it a simple lapse on the part of the operator or was it a mistake a more conscious action that the user did but since his model the mental model that he had for performing the action was flawed in some way the error resulted so those kind of analysis can be done now the task by using gem in hra is to determine the probability that an individual will make an error while monitoring skill based error or will apply the wrong or correct rule at the right or wrong time which is rule based error so why did the error occur whether it is a rule based or it is a skill based reason for the error now at the knowledge based level the task is to determine the probability that some type of decision making biases is likely to occur that prevents the novel thinking required to solve the current problem another reason for error could be that the human while making a decision was flawed on his decision making and because of that the error occurred so if an error occurred and we can predict the error using therp and human reliability analyst can use gems to find out the possible reason and cognitive factors that led to the error on the part of the operator now regardless of the type of hra one must know the task the task sequence and steps the performance criteria the working environment and potential errors in the estimated probabilities and the consequences related to the action to be perform so when using gems with hra we have to know how the task was done the sequence of the task performance the criteria for the task performance the environments and environment related factors what kind of errors occur and the probabilities and after the error what was the consequence was it an accident or was it a near miss and all those combined together to give some idea of what is going in the mind of the operator or what are the cognitive basis of error on the part of the operator now assuming that an error has occurred two things can happen one an accident happen because of which there is loss of life and property and that could also be a near miss where a near to accident situation happened but by using some mechanism it was corrected so then look at let's look at those possibilities now the very various types of errors but these errors necessarily do not turn out to be accidents an error is a non performing an action performing the incorrect action on performing the correct action out of sequence at the wrong time so errors could be not doing an action which is a slip performing the incorrect action which is a commission error a not performing an action could be also an omission error or performing the correct action out of sequence or at the wrong time is again a commission error so it could be a slip or it could be a mistake a mistake is performing the action a slip is not performing the action so error could be any ways this could lead either to a miss or an accident so let's understand what is a miss and what is an accident a near miss occurs when there is an error but no accident but there was a potential for an accident so i stretched my hand to pick up an object from the table and in this action since i was not looking at where my hand was going i accidentally 
tumbled over the glass containing water. I realized this very soon and caught the glass midway to landing flat on the floor. So, I prevented the accident which could have resulted in breaking the glass tumbler and spoiling the water. This is a near miss. Now, near misses and accidents are a generic output of errors. So, what is an accident then? An accident occurs when something happens unexpectedly or without an intention and this event leads to some type of consequence such as damages or injury. So, accidents mainly result in injury or some type of adverse consequence. As some errors are classified as intentional, an accident occurs when someone did not intend to cause an accident or was unaware that this behavior could or would cause damage or injury. So, accidents are never intentional. These are actions which are done by people which lead to an injury or some kind of loss, but they are never intentional. So, when an accident or near miss happens or mostly an accident happens, what should be the next goal of the operator? It should naturally be reporting the accident, but we find that most people do not report accidents. Why does it happen and what does accident reporting? actually bring to the table. So, if we report an accident and errors, we can evaluate the preceding events to hopefully determine the cause of these errors and accidents. If we report an accident, we will come to know what caused the accident because analyst would be able to track down all behaviors which were desirable and all behaviors which are non-desirable. Even system will function and can, when come up with those reasons why the accident happened. Now, once the causes are known, we can make effort to reduce these causes. So, once you know why an accident has happened, we can probably give solutions to how prevent these actions. People are often reluctant to admit or report errors because the system essentially punishes the reporting behavior. In a normal day to day life, we see that people do not report accidents and the probable reason is that if you report an accident, it could lead to some undesirable consequence. Either your license is withheld or you are punished with a fine or some other form of punishment is given to you. And so, people abstain from reporting accidents. This non-reporting of accident is problematic and a system error when we do not receive notice of error that could help us determine and fix the cause of error and accidents. If we do not report these accidents, it becomes a problem because we will never come to know what caused the accidents. So, it is always advisable to report accidents because this will provide enough data for analysts to determine why accidents happen and what can be done to prevent these accidents. Also by looking at the nature of error made which led to an accident, a better system design can be planned which can lead to minimization of these errors. So, what is error detection and correction? The various means to reduce errors include monitoring ourselves or self monitoring and double checking. One way to reduce our errors, particularly lapses and slip based errors, is monitoring ourselves. We can constantly double check and self monitor our behavior, and that way 
we will be able to come up with those behaviors or those actions which can lead to error or which can lead to further problems. Establishing cues within the environment to indicate an error has occurred is another reason and a solution that should be employed by operators. So, how do we establish this queue? We can use blocking functions that prohibit the next behavior if other behaviors are not completed first. We can create self checks and self hindrances and that will make us stop at the point of hindrance and see if we have completed the earlier behavior. So, if you want to eat food, let us say, one possible check we can do is to see whether we have washed our hands or not. And by keeping this check, we can make sure that none of the outside infection related viruses and bacteria which stuck to our hand gets mixed with the food and is ingested as part of the food and because of which people can get into diseases. So, one rule or one check we can do is before eating anything wash our hands. So, this is the way where we can put a blocking function. We can also have others review our work. So, means of error correction also require and suggest to use other experts and colleagues which can review our work and provide a part type of quality control. And the last method we can use is error reporting systems. We can establish reporting systems which can record errors and give it to people who are analysts who can then later look at how the error has happened and find out possible points of error and solution to those errors. For us to reduce errors, we must be able to correctly identify errors. One important factor in error reporting is to identify the error. If we are not able to identify the error, we will not be able to report it. Now, there are several factors which contribute to errors. Different types of errors possibly occurring at the input process or the output phase of a system suggest there are different potential causes of errors. Causes of errors might arise because of the individual or the system. The errors that we have di discussed up till now can occur both at the individual level as well as the system level. And so, there are a number of factors both individual and system level factors. On the individual front, it could be personality type, it could be related to your cognitive limits, it could be related to other environment related factors like stresses and sleep deprivation and system related factors could be an inappropriate design of the system or a non machine readable, a non human readable format of output which humans cannot read and because of which errors can occur. Let us discuss these factors one by one. So, individual ability, training levels, emotional states, personality and stress levels are all possible causes of error that are internal to the individual. Individual related factors for errors comprise of people's ability, whether they have the ability to do a job. So, while selection, we can look at certain requirements of a job. 
if you are doing a bank related job you should be good with numbers and this kind of selection criteria can be used. The type of training that people get and the kind of emotionality that people have. If you are too emotional, you tend to bring in emotions in your work and because of that your decision making abilities could suffer. Personalities and stresses are other reasons and all of them comprise together to form the individual factors which can lead to errors. Components of the system that might cause errors include workspace environment, task complexity and shift work. System related factors could be how the workspace is designed. In the design of workspace we looked at how we could have an open or a closed workspace and what kind of benefits and problems these workspace can create. So, this design of workspace, the kind of task that you do, how difficult it is and when we do the task, what is our time frame of doing the task, whether it is morning or evening and how many shifts we do the task in, all can contribute to the system factor of an error. There are often other contributing factors or events such as a storm that disrupt an electrical power. So, external factors or nature related factors could also lead to errors. Individual factors that contribute to error include personalities, attitudes, limitations in decision making, information processing and memory. All of these factors we have covered in the past lectures be it your personality type as being more outgoing or more conservative, be it your attitudes which is how strongly do you hold your belief and how emotionally you are involved in your belief, how knowledgeable and expertise do you have in the area of your work could also lead to impaired decision making and then cognitive factors like information processing capacity and memory capacity all of these comprise of individual factors to errors. Human limitations are impacted by additional factors like level of expertise, sleep deprivation and stress. We will discuss these factors one by one. Now, individuals with more ability, knowledge, skill, training or time on the job are more likely to work in an automated fashion and have more resources to draw on when needing to create unique solution. As expertise increases, workload decreases as the task is well understood. So, one way to counteract the error at the individual level is expertise. The more expertise you gain in your area of work, the more experience you gain in your area of work, the more automated your work performance will become. Because of this, there will be fewer errors to follow up. As you gain more expertise, your workload decreases because you know all parts of the system and all jobs that you have to do and as you know the task very well, you can perform these jobs automatically which can lead to less time being spent and less load being put on your cognitive capacity. So, expertise can reduce errors. Deprivation of sleep can also lead to errors and it has been found that sleep deprivation tended to reduce our ability 
to think systematically and impacts our memory, perception, concentration and reaction times. Deprivation of sleep is linked to a number of cognitive deficits. Even with 12 to 24 hours of sleep deprivation, these effects are very evident. Drivers who perform both the shifts in driving or are not provided enough rest, they show this cognitive deficit. But one interesting factor which is seen to increase with sleep deprivation is overconfidence in the task performance. So, while people actually show reduced performances, they are quite overconfident in their ability to perform the task. It has been reported that the loss of sleep, 20 to 25 hours of wakefulness are similar to having a blood alcohol content of 0.1 percent. So, loss of sleep for even 15 to 16 hours while doing your job can create situations which are similar to those when people have blood alcohol content of 0.1 percent. But as I discussed that especially in youngsters, overconfidence is a output or overconfidence is seen to increase in people having sleep deprivation. This overconfidence is in their task performing ability. Now, Navy pilots were tested with caffeine and a moderate amount of caffeine after deprivation of sleep led to better performances and higher overconfidence on their daily job. But when a comparison was done with those pilots which have had proper sleep, a significant decrease in performance were reported because of sleep loss. So, deprivation of sleep is an impact important factor which can lead to errors. Stresses can also lead to errors. Stress generally arises because we perceive too great of a demand on ourselves or our ability to cope with these demands. So, if we have too much job demands or personal demands, this can create a situation where we are not able to cope with those demands and we get into either physical or mental stress. Because of this stress, we cannot focus on the work which can lead to errors. Now, the demand occurs due to disturbances in the environment known as stressors. So, these stressors which leads to decreased performances and decrease task attention can be divided into three different categories. Environmental stresses include physical aspect of the environment such as the air quality and the temperature. We have discussed this in previous sections. Psychological stress includes issues of workload and cognitive appraisal. We have also discussed this in the last sections and issues of fatigue, sleep loss or deprivation and work shifts are considered as temporal stressors. This is something which we are discussing now. Now, with enough stressors, a severe stressor or a stressor over a long period of time 
everyone usually becomes stressed. So, it is not that one stressor can lead to performance decrements and cause stress. One single stressor over a period of time or in severity can ha have consequences similar to multiple stressors. So, it is the nature, the length and the type of stressor which determine how stressed you would be which in turn would lead to errors. There, are, there could be system related factors too which can cause errors. So, systems are composed of people performing various tasks while using an assortment of tools and technologies. System level aspects such as the organization culture can impact safety. So, organization type, organization culture, organization hierarchy, organization policies, all these can also lead to stress. If an individual have the necessary knowledge, the skill and the ability to perform a task well, if various opticals exist such as policies and procedures that complicate the job, workers often create their own shortcuts or workaround. So, if you have a number of bogus policies or performance decreasing policies in your workspace and workplace, people even if they have the required qualification and the ability are bogged down, slowed down in performing the job because they will have to comply with the standards of the system and the policies of the system. And so, a number of times it is the system policies which slow people and make them do error. Think of a system where a person who is doing a very simple job of monitoring things have to report this into multiple ways like writing it with hand, putting it into the computer and several other ways of doing it and then carry these reports to the next higher authority for getting a clearance of what should be done. If a policy like this exists, even if a worker is skilled in solving a problem, he will not solve a problem or if he tries to solve a problem, it could lead to error. So, a number of system related factors are also the reason for errors. The communication process and the management and leadership style contribute to system function. So, what kind of communication exists between the workers and the management? The type of management that the workplace has and the type of leader who is governing the people working under him all will contribute to the system function and this can be classified as the system factors to error. As the various components of a system are interdependent, sometimes there is a need to correct how communication flows and how management approaches an issue. So, given that we have errors and we have discussed the factors of an error, how should we reduce these errors? Selecting or developing human users who are reliable and have minimal error can help reduce the likelihood of errors. So, selection and training programs could be made which can help select those individuals which have the necessary skill and have higher reliability in performing a job and that could reduce errors. Experts make fewer error and can solve problems better. Training increases individuals knowledge and skill levels whereby the individuals work more efficiently at all of the SRK which is the skill, the rule and the knowledge based levels. So, if you are an expert, you can solve a problem much better and resolve problem much better and by training experts, this skill solving can be 
enhanced further. So, a lot less error would result. As trained individuals that is experts have better understanding of the job, they are only moderately stressed and perform better during high demand situations than inexperienced and non-trained individuals. So, using experts who are well trained and have a knowledge about the job and have enough level of training, errors could be reduced by employing these people to jobs. Beside training individuals to be expert, another means to reduce stress is to train individuals to develop and using coping mechanisms. So, another way in which errors could be reduced on a job is to train people to handle their stress. There are a number of coping mechanisms which could be both physiological or psychological that can be taught to workers and by using these coping mechanisms the workers can get rid of the stress or at least delay the stressor till the work has finished and that way the performance can be increased. A good coping mechanism is not thinking about the situation which is psychological in nature or interacting with a friend and talking this thing out which could be more physical type of coping of a stressor. Now, beside training individuals to be experts, another means to reduce stress is to train individuals to develop and use coping mechanisms which we just discussed. As systems and tasks become more complex, human information processing and memory limitations pose a problem. So, with complex systems, the kind of processing of information that humans do and the limitation in terms of memory and attention also pose problems while performing a job and these problems can lead to errors. So, how should we tackle these? Most skills can be retained in long term memory, but long sequences of behaviors can be forgotten. Although rules and ways of doing things can be retained in long term memory, but while performing a job it is the working memory that you are using. So, the effective retrieval of rules and what needs to be done in a particular situation to reduce errors sometimes suffers because the right retrieval queue is not initiated. In these cases checklists can be done and these checklists or performance aids such as written instructions are helpful. While performing a operation, most doctors use a checklist which give them the surety that the tiniest possible procedure and function has been completed before performing the operation. A similar situation arises with airline pilots where they have a checklist before flight to test the smallest possible cause of error and if everything works fine only then they take off. So, checklist could be a way to prevent slips and lapses and also mistakes. Now, at the system level we can use system analysis to determine and correct errors. System perspective help us understand all interacting and impacting components of a system of interest. The feedback loop is critical in determining how well the actual system output compares with the ideal system output. Any identified discrepancies can be addressed to reduce these errors. So, at the system level we can have feedback loops from various system components and these can help us prevent errors. One means of decreasing errors at the system level is to change the task or work with proper human factor design. So, task redesigning can also improve system related performances 
by reducing system related errors. By using human factor design, the task or the system design can be changed so that system related errors do not occur. Work under load due to automation can be problematic because the operator becomes bored and are likely to take on other tasks unrelated to the current activity. One problem which can arise because of which system errors could creep up is task under load. If the system is so automatic that it requires fewer input from the part of the operator, the operator diverts his attention somewhere else and because of which he cannot monitor the system in the way he should which could lead to errors. So, task under load can be handled. Task redesign could impact a number of other factors such as training, communication and workflow. Additional variables that impact task performance and task flow, task redesign could impact a number of other factors such as training, communication and workflow. Additional variables that impact task performance, design and conditions, improper supervision and operate outside the individual that is external performance specific factors are also considered system factors. So, a number of variables are considered system factors and they all contribute to system related reasons for errors. Now, by addressing these variables like performance related factors or outside supervision and other factors, we can reduce system related errors. One way to reduce errors is designing warnings. So, by designing effective warnings, system related errors could be reduced. Now, warnings are intended to help us to save performance of a job by supplying information so that we can use a product without injury and live in an environment without harm. Warnings can help us do a job properly and safely and because of these warnings, a lot of injury and a lot of loss can be prevented. This information should influence safe behavior as well as serve as a reminder about what dangers or problems exist and what behaviors will help us avoid getting hurt or making an error. So, warning can help us do safe behaviors or notify us of certain situations which can lead to consequent errors. If warnings are designed in a proper way, it can lead to accident preventions. Now, when discussing warnings, the first question to address is whether we ever notice this warning. It is essential that warnings are created only after a good high quality human factor design is implemented along with various guards and procedures to protect us. It is seen that a number of times there are a lot of warnings but people do not pay heed to it. People do not even notice it. How many times it has happened when you bought a new phone and you have not looked at the warning which is provided on the back cover of the phone or the packaging of the phone. Sometimes when warnings are there, it is written in such a way that it is non perceptible. And because people do not read these warnings, they get into trouble. So, one way of making an effective warning is that it should be notifiable. People should be able to notice it. The skull and the cross, which is a warning, can be misinterpreted by smaller children as a game from the pirates of the Caribbean. And they could think that it is a pirate game. So, instead of not entering that place, they would enter the place because this warning could have a different meaning. So, not only making a warning notifiable, but also meaningfulness of a warning has a lot to play in terms of reducing errors. Variables such as selection of the most competent people and the level of training received influences not only the individual's ability to do the task, but also the ability to understand and implement the warning. 
So, using the right people with the most competent skill will help us designing better warnings. An effective warning must be noticed. So, warnings which are effective have the property of being notifiable or noticed, has the property of being understood and implementable to avoid the errors or to remedy of the error. If we have a warning and if it is noticeable and understood, but there is no way to implement the warning or what the warning says. In those cases, the warning is helpless in affecting and influencing the behavior of people which can reduce errors. So, not only warnings should be put, but it should also be made sure that the ways of implementing this warning are also well thought of and nicely put into words. Now, one must consider the characteristics of the warning, the intended audience of the message and the situation or environment in which the warning is needed. So, while designing warning, we should look at what the warning means, to whom it is meant for, whether it is children or older people or younger people and the situation and the environment in which the warning is given. Suppose the warning is good and it is understandable and for the right population, but the situation in which the warning is given does not permit us to notify the warning. A degraded environment situation, the warning is of no good. So, all these factors should be considered for designing warnings. Warnings are usually visual, written notices or images or auditory which are bells, voices and messages. Most warnings form in two categories and we have discussed this also before. We have the visual warning which could be labels, which could be signs and signposts. It could be images depicting what not to do and how to do something and if you do an action what it could result to. But there could be auditory warnings, for example, those dings from your refrigerator or your microwave oven, which tell you that a function is complete and your food is cooked. Warnings which are specific types of displays should reflect the application of good human factor science to the design of display discussed. To be noticed, visual warnings need to be accessible by being within the visual field during the event. If you have a visual warning, it should be made in such a way that it remains in the focus of vision. If a warning stays outside the focus of vision, it would be of very less use to people. So, warning should be made and placed in such a way that it should be within the focus of people who it is meant to be used for. Auditory warnings are not as restrictive given the omnidirection nature of sound. Auditory warnings does not need to be in people's focus because sound is omnidirectional and can come from any direction. However, the message contained in the auditory display need to be simpler and shorter. If we have a long warning or incoherent warning, it is of less use than more of a problem. You have seen those walker escalator or walking escalators on airports and they keep on telling you how you should step, step on it and what kind of actions you should do while using it. These warnings are so loud that it is good for people who are using it, but for other people it becomes a nuisance. So, other methods of warning should be designed which should not be inconvenient for other people. So, how should we design an effective warning? First, it should be understood. A warning should be understood in the sense that the format of written warning could be in bulleted outline. We can use an image and we could make it such that it should be understandable to audiences at various literacy level. If you use a very flowery language or too technical language of a warning, it will be of no use. 
So, we can use pictures, images and some form of non literally method to present warnings because then it will be evident for most people. An implementation of a warning can the explicit instruction be executed and consider situation environment. So, while putting warnings two more things should be considered first whether it is explicit the instructions that the warning provide and whether the situations provide the execution of this warning. Once a warning is issued, it should be complied to. So, perception of the risk and level of familiarity with the risk influence compliance of a warning. So, while complying with a warning, the level of familiarity and the risk of that warning are both considered. If an individual believes there is little risk or he or she is less likely to heed the warning, if the risk is perceived to be high, a person is more likely to look for and read a warning. So, warning should be designed in such a way that it should give the immediate meaning that it is going to be of high risk and then people will comply to it. Familiarity with the situation also appears to impact perceived risk. The more familiar a person is with a situation, the more comfortable the person becomes with the situation unless he or she has a bad experience and the less likely the person will follow look for or read a warning. While traveling on the train, most people hang out from the train door. There is a warning which says do not open doors or do not move your head out. But they are so experienced, they have traveled so many times that they believe that this warning is of no heed till the point of time one day when they fall off the train and they realize that the warning has meaning and other people related to it. So, if you are too familiar with a situation, still you should pay heed to warnings. Compliance to warning is a cost benefit analysis. While complying to warning, people do a cost benefit analysis as in what is the risk and what is the benefit I am going to get out of complying to the warning. When the benefit is perceived to be high, a person is more likely to comply with the warning. In contrast, with the perceived cost of compliance is high because the perception is that the environment is unsafe and the precautionary behaviors are not necessary, the less likely one will comply. So, compliance depends upon how you perceive a warning and what are the risks involved. To ensure greater compliance, the warning must first be well designed for noticing and understanding which is enhanced with understandable images. So, making a higher compliance with warning, a more meaningful, a more noticing image has to be produced and this should in itself provide you high risk of non-compliance. Warning should be explicit in number one, what is the hazard? So, warning should be telling you what hazard is it going to be, whether it is a fire that is going to be, two, what is the consequence? If there is a fire, what can happen? You can get burned. Third, the proper behavior to avoid an unsafe situation. For example, in fire, what should you do? Should not put your hand in the fire or should not instruct and get involved in a fire. So, warning should give you hazards, should tell you the consequence and the proper behavior to be followed. If all these things are there in a warning, a warning is a good warning. Auditory warnings have the advantage of non requiring a specific location, but must be designed to be distinguishable from the noise within the environment. Also, oral or voice messages cannot be too complex and people often habituate to these warnings which means that they begin to ignore the warning. Auditory warnings have this property of being omnidirectional which means that it can be heard but they should also be designed in such a way that so that it does not become redundant and too repetitive. If that is what happens people will start ignoring it. So, for designing a safe environment a number of steps can be followed. We should design tool or environment for in the world intuitive knowledge. Tools, designs and designs of systems should be made in such a way that it uses the in world knowledge. It makes people do things either using rules or using skills. It should not make people think and use knowledge based 
behaviors for performing an action. Select the best employees to reduce error. We should focus on selecting and training those employees which fit best for a particular job. Train employees to remove error. Training and multiple trainings over a period of time should be provided to people so that they perform the job better. Provide aids. Providing checklist and quality control can also make sure that people do not commit slips and mistakes. Establish organization structure to support safety. We can create a more healthy organization structure with lesser policies and lesser hindrances in performances which can lead to more safer environment and lesser errors and then create warnings. We can also use warnings and through the use of warnings we can define what should be done and how should particular behavior be done so that lesser errors can creep in. So, in this section we discussed about human errors and I also explained to you what type of errors are there, what kind of factors lead to error and what can be done to reduce errors. I explained to you different mechanisms of studying error and human reliability and discussed in detail factors which are system based and individual based which influence error production. This is all for now. Namaskar and thank you. Thank you.